Hello and welcome to Videocam and Audiocam for Cam Scotland. My name is Scott Doherty and I'm here today with Bill Eddy. Uh, Bill is president of the High Conflict Institute, which, although based in San Diego, provides conflict uh, training for individuals and professionals around the world. Um, Bill is a mediator, a family law specialist and therapist, but foremost uh, is known as a, a true pioneer uh, in the development of simple techniques to manage high conflict people in various life situations, including separation. So welcome, Bill. Thank you very much. It's good to be with you, Scott. Brilliant. Now, much of your work um, appears to stem from research and brain development uh, and how the brain acts or reacts uh, in a time of conflict. Um, in your hugely practical book, uh, So What's Your Proposal?, uh, you mentioned, for example, that in the face of conflict, um, without our realising it perhaps, the amygdala part of the brain uh, can shut down the logical problem-solving part of the brain in less than a hundredth of a second. Uh, and I was wondering if you could sp expand a little on what's happening there. Sure, my pleasure. And actually, to help us, I've brought along an extra brain. Excellent. So... <laughs> Let me uh, separate this brain because the brain really has two halves. And the way you're looking at it now, uh, this is the, um, let's see, the way you're seeing this, this is the right brain and this is the left brain looking at me. Okay. So actually maybe I should turn it around. I'm not sure if this is your left and right. I think this is how it appears to you. Does this appear on the right? Uh, that's actually on the left, but... <laughs> okay. Well, well, we'll, we'll switch back so that yeah. you can see me. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's interesting here is the two halves of the brain have a different emphasis in how they deal with problem solving. So the, the left half of the brain the, the, the uh, left half of the brain over here yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is um, where we think of language more, reading, writing, talking, listening, analyzing problems, looking at details, etc. And so when you're problem solving, your left brain's probably dominant and you're looking for solutions. Sure. Now, the right brain, the right hemisphere, seems to be in many ways a more creative hemisphere, kind of a big picture side of the brain. Uh, this may be the more artistic, more creative. If you have an aha moment, that may be more likely the right brain. Uh, but the right brain scanning the world for danger also. In other words, am I safe or I, am I in danger? And the right brain looks at nonverbal aspects of human communication. So while the left brain may be hearing words, the right brain is hearing tone of voice and similar parts of the brain, kind of where my index fingers are, sure. similar parts are processing the words over here in terms of content, over here in terms of relationship or tone. Now, here's where it gets interesting, is both hemispheres have an amygdala and the amygdala is inside, right in the middle here. And the amygdala gets the message first if there's danger. If you see danger, zoom right in there. Uh, can be less than uh, six thousandths of a second. Wow. That the amygdala goes, oh my goodness, we're in danger, run, or fight, the or freeze. Nobody yeah. notices. Sure. Yeah. So the right amygdala is particularly sensitive to facial expressions of fear and anger. The left amygdala apparently is more affected by written words, by threats. It still responds to threats and says, look out, this, doesn't, this letter doesn't look very good to us. <laughs> sure. And we've all seen plenty of that. <laughs> yeah. So what's interesting is at any given time, one hemisphere is dominant. And generally, the left brain is dominant most of the day while we're solving problems, et cetera. But the right brain becomes dominant in a crisis or totally new situation. And if the amygdala, the right amygdala especially, is triggered enough, it basically shuts off the logical thinking 
and puts all the energy into fight, flight, or freeze, how do we deal with this threat, whether it's another person or some other kind of threat? So as you mentioned in the book, the So What's Your Proposal, we want to shift people from upset defensive thinking to problem solving. Okay. And so what seems to happen, and people do this all the time, and it's a big mistake, is they criticize people who are upset. It's like, don't be so upset, and that makes the person more upset. Or calm down, and that makes the person more upset. So one of the things we suggest, a real basic, simple technique, it's amazingly simple, is don't criticize what the person's doing is just say, okay, you're talking about a problem, so what's your proposal? And by getting them thinking, now you're getting them over into the more logical part of the brain, sure. generally helps calm them down and gets them busy problem solving so they're not quickly reacting again. Yes. So for example, if I'm doing a mediation, and one of the parties is pointing the finger at the other party saying, you never did this and you always did that, I can say, well, then, what's your proposal? Because if I say, stop pointing your finger, <laughs> and, and I say, stop talking about the past, then that makes them more upset because yeah. that's, that's defensive. It's triggering. So we, we stay future focused, problem solving focused, mm -hmm. and that way we can actually shift them from upset into working on solutions with us. So, so you're saying then that for someone that's trying to sort things out after separation, um, things like financial division or what's to happen with the kids, yeah. uh, but the conflict is still quite raw um, and getting in the way of discussing things uh, with some civility what you're saying is that uh, although there's an automatic response uh, in the brain, yeah. um, it can be switched. It's something that, that's not irreparable. Right. And also we want to help keep things calm. And there's another aspect of the brain, and that's mirror neurons. And we tend to mirror each other. It seems to be part of human nature. If someone's very agitated and upset, we feel ourselves getting agitated and upset. If someone's calm, even if someone else is upset, the person who stays calm may help us become more calm just because we're reading their mood and mirroring their mood. Yeah. So here's another trick is when you're dealing with a conflict is if you stay calm, the other people are likely to stay calm as well. And if someone's getting agitated but you're staying calm, don't mirror them and they'll generally mirror you. Yeah. And I've seen that over and over again in disputes, especially in uh, mediation, that people that are getting upset, if I can stay calm, they kind of get tired of being upset. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. And it's interesting, it's, it's an, a different way of looking at it, because a lot of what we do as mediators, you tend to think, oh, well, it's personality. But what you're saying, it's a bit more primal than that it's and I think you'd mentioned before that there was a, a an experiment done with a, was it monkeys and what was happening during the break yeah that they really um, discovered mirror neurons because monkeys that they were trying to find where in the brain uh, were the neurons that triggered certain hand movements and when they weren't doing the experiment and the researchers were taking a break or something, they were picking things up and the electrodes were buzzing or sounding an alarm. And that they started realizing they're watching us, but when they're watching us, they think they're doing the, the neurons, the mirror neurons are, are acting as though it's the monkey doing it. And they've realized then with humans that it's very uh, similar, that we really tend to mirror the behavior we see other people doing, which is part of our very social um, DNA, I think. Yeah. Uh, that we're really, this is how, how we can work in large groups because we synchronize with each other. Sure, sure. And do you think when you say large groups, do you think that's why mediation, for example, works? 
I, th I think so. And interestingly, why more adversarial processes make people more adversarial. Because there and, you see conflict and, emitting, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because I've worked with mediation for over 30 years. I've worked in family law for over 20 years as a lawyer. And as people get ready to go to court, they, they get more upset and they mirror each other in their phone calls, text messages, emails, all of that. And because court often takes a long time getting into court and then finishing, uh, a couple may spend a year learning how to be angry. And in mediation, they may spend, you know, maybe weeks learning how to make proposals and how to listen and how to talk to each other. Sure. And the, the biggest impact of this, of course, is on the kids. I've had many cases where by the time a big decision is made in family court about the parenting plan, the parents can no longer talk to each other. They're just so upset. And in mediation, seeing people sometimes shake hands, sometimes give each other a hug after they're done, um, it's, just, it's just beautiful to me. Yeah. But it's not easy because we're taking the same people that are used to going to court and trying to help them calm down and communicate. Sure. So what about um, people um, who are already used to conflict? Se separation of itself, of course, creates conflict sometimes. But what about those um, people who might be thought of generally, even before the separation, as high conflict people? Um, in other words, perhaps because of the way they've been brought up, um, then it's, they, they, they perhaps find it more difficult to make that big shift that you've referred to in the past. Can conflict management still have a, a reasonable effect on people like that? Well, it's, it's, there's really a range, I think, of possibilities. So I, I was a, a therapist doing child and family and couples counseling before I became a family lawyer. And a lot of the things I learned to help people communicate um, it really was getting people to practice and getting both people to work together. Yeah. And, and in many cases, there'd be one person working hard and another person kind of sitting back going, no, that's not good enough. And, and so, you know, in doing couples counseling, it wasn't uncommon that one or both people say, this just isn't going to work for us. We've, you know, we need to go our own way. And so I think it's worth trying all of these techniques in a relationship. And in fact, I encourage people, try doing your end of the relationship in new ways, then see how the other person responds. And if they become more flexible and, and communicate more uh, calmly, et cetera, then maybe you can make the relationship work. And if they're just really offended all the time and they're angry and they're throwing things and they're swearing at you and it's always all your fault, yep. you know, you don't, it's not a healthy way to live and most people don't live that way in relationships. So maybe it is time to move on. Sure, sure. So you've mentioned before that um, although emotions are contagious, um, and can lead to a cycle of what you call defensive reacting. Um, logical thinking and mirroring is also contagious. Uh, and thinking of mediation then, you've also described before how a mediator effectively can act like the corpus callosum uh, of the brain. In other words, a bridge uh, between the, the defensive reacting and the... the let, let me just show point that out. That's yeah. this... this bridge part here that helps them connect. That's so right. you're right, the corpus callosum. Good. Yeah, and that's right too. Excellent. And I thought the imagery of, of the mediator effectively acting as that bridge um, was quite it was quite potent. Um, so I, I was just wondering if you could explain how that works in mediation, how the mediator can make that bridge. Well I think that uh, when people are reacting, see in many ways the uh, so they're upset and and not thinking much is first of all the mediator staying calm 
But saying something, I call it an ear statement that shows empathy, attention, and respect, tends to calm the right brain. So I see how frustrated you are. I, I want to understand and listen and really pay attention. And I have a lot of respect for your efforts. Those are the kinds of phrases and the kind of tone of voice the right brain likes to hear and it calms down. But then you need to focus people on tasks, on problem solving. So you're getting them from here over to here. That's why what's your proposal seems to work. Um, that's why writing lists seems to work. Uh, when you're writing a list, you're really in your left hemisphere near the problem-solving parts. And the brain is fascinating. It's very efficient. So related tasks seem close together. So all the fight or flight and run parts in, in the right hemisphere seem to be close together. And then looking at logically analyzing things in details, et cetera, in the left hemisphere. Sure. So that's how they work together. Yeah, that's interesting. And as so, you see, it, it, the, the bridge um, between them, it, it, it could be switched so quickly. Um, yeah. What's amazing to me is to see people discussing finances or parenting schedule, and suddenly one of them's outraged. <laughs> and they're and I can almost see their, their right brain hitting the ceiling. <laughs> and so I realize I need to say some calming statements rather than, you know, calm down is, wow, that was pretty upsetting to hear. Let's talk about that a little bit so that the person feels that I'm with them, not against them. And yet the other person also needs to see, and I need to have eye contact with both and say, no, you know, let's talk about this. I think we need to talk it in, in more depth. So let me give a little explanation and then let's see what you think. And while I'm explaining, people's, you know, are calming down a little bit. Sure. Uh, and that's a tip also for mediators is when things are, are getting agitated, give an ear statement, empathy, attention, respect, and then explain something, give some education about the topic. And while you're talking, it gives them a chance to breathe. Yeah, I, I might mention I actually have a three-hour demonstration video of using these techniques that I call new ways for mediation. So if anyone's ever interested in seeing people yelling at me, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's something we have on our website. Yeah, it really is fascinating to watch, and I would certainly recommend that to, to those watching or listening. The, the, yeah. A common issue, though, um, that we come across in, in mediation, um, you may have seen this yourself, is where the parties are making good progress, um, mm -hmm. lots of uh, your statements and empathy and what have you, um, during the sessions. But it's the in-between that perhaps gets in the way. In between sessions and there's perhaps email or letter communication that sets them back a little. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little about your BIF response and how that might help. Yeah, the BIF response is designed for writing and especially was designed as a way to respond to hostile emails. So you get someone's email and it's all capitals, all bold, all italics, and it, you just feel them screaming at you. <laughs> and so you, you type back act something that's brief, informative, friendly, and firm. And that's it. It just keeps it contained because people write pages of explanation. You've overreacted. Let me tell you why. And that just triggers people more. So it's better to just be brief. Informative is just some piece of information. It's not an argument. It's not emotions. It's not a criticism. It's just... Um, you may not be aware of such and such. And that, may, that often helps calm the conflict. It's friendly in that you say, you know, thank you for letting me know your concerns. Um, here's some information. Uh, have a nice weekend. Or I appreciate your commitment to resolving this. Something positive. And firm, meaning it just ends the conversation that you don't feed another barb to trigger them to argue more. Um, but sometimes you need information. So you might say, with this new information, 
please let me know if I can pick up the kids Friday at five. Let me know by Thursday at five. Sure. Yes or no. Something like that. So sometimes it's a yes or no question. Sometimes it's just I'm done with the conversation. But that's, that's a Biff response. And I did want to mention you said something very important that mystifies a lot of mediators and lawyers. And that is you get people calmly reaching an agreement finally, but then they go off and they don't sleep that night or they get outraged the next day. And my theory is that what we're seeing is the mediator and let's say, or lawyers, were acting as the corpus callosum, helping them to work together. But after you weren't there, they started thinking and triggering themselves and now, let's say, because I've had clients that call the next day, they say, I couldn't sleep all night. I can't believe you made me agree to that <laughs> terrible agreement. Yes. And, and I'll say, well, actually, do you want to go over how that happened and see, you know, and it's always up to you. If you want to make new proposals, you can. You haven't signed anything that's binding yet. Although sometimes, especially with lawyers negotiating it, court, the parties have signed something that's binding. But in either case, I suggest saying, I appreciate that this is upsetting. I know it's a hard time. And so let's just talk about this. I want to hear your concerns. And then if you're interested, I can explain again how we reached that decision yesterday. Um, and then talking it through, sometimes they say, oh, you know, you're right. I'm just going to let it be. Yeah. <laughs> So are you saying then that um, perhaps in a situation where um, the, the, the conflicted side of the brain is, has been going up and down during sessions, are you saying that that almost affects the memory then? Uh, yes. Um, I think it interferes with memory. A lot, of, a lot of our memories seem to be stored more in the left hemisphere because they're stored with words. Um, also, in the left hemisphere is where you have a sense of safety. So if you're reacting more in this kind of right brain upset and the left hemisphere is offline, it's hard to put it into a story into the past. And the right brain seems more focused when it's defensive on the present. Yes. And the left brain's where you have more looking at the past solutions to apply to the future. So that seems to to be part of the problem that, it, that people can't remember. And I've been in court many times as a lawyer, and I've walked out of a difficult hearing, and my client has said, Bill, what happened in there? <laughs> I don't remember anything because they were so triggered and defensive. So it's good to know. And sometimes mediators send notes in between sessions. I, I don't usually do that, but occasionally on request I do that. But sometimes it helps just to summarize at the end of a session kind of what we've done and what, what we need, what are we going to address next time. And I often tell people, think of two proposals for each issue that we still haven't resolved so that you can come in with some flexibility. Yeah. You mentioned two proposals in, again, your book. So what's your proposal? You talked a little about why three proposals uh, might be a, a better idea. Is that? Well, what I, what I do with the clients is I ask them to think of at least two proposals in order to get away from just having one. Sure. Uh, three would be even better. But if, if we as professionals say, well, here are some options that other people have tried. You want to say at least three so they don't get stuck one likes one and one likes the other. So when you're talking to more than one person, try to give them at least three ideas. Yeah, that's right. And, and again, you're, you're engaging their logical uh, thinking part of the, the brain in coming up with options rather than being stuck with left or right. right. Is it? Right. And I think, I think we want to encourage the parties to come up with the proposals and think of things, but they honestly get stuck and they haven't dealt with a situation like a separation or divorce before. So it, and we have knowledge, we might as well share it with them, but don't share it as here's the right answer is here's some different possibilities. Does any of that help you in thinking about this? 
and emphasizing it's up to you. Yeah. So that, because one of the things high conflict people like to get into power struggles, and it's not that they like it, it's just familiar to them. So it's easy to say, well, this is what you have to do. And the next thing you know, they're doing the opposite. Yeah. So it's better to say, here's your choices. Now it's up to you. That's right. And, and it's your choice. Yeah. So you mentioned about um, parties getting stuck uh, yeah. and having difficulty in the process. Now, I've talked in other interviews with mediators about um, parties not, perhaps not having the mindset um, to, to manage their conflict within mediation sessions, and perhaps they would benefit from some coaching and some advice, advice outside uh, of mediation. Right. Um, and uh, so I'd like to talk a little about some of the programs that you've been developing um, over in San Diego in the US. Um, and specifically the, the programs that um, might assist those parties getting stuck um, with the, the conflict getting in the way. Um, you mentioned yeah. you, you have a, a program called, you mentioned already, New Ways for Mediation and also New, Ma New Ways for Families. Do you want to talk a little about that? Okay. Yes, New Ways for Families was designed originally as a coaching method to help potentially high-conflict parents learn some small skills and small steps like BIF responses and calming their upset emotions and uh, making proposals and other aspects of self-management, doing this for several sessions. So ideally, they would do it for six sessions. Both parents would go through that. Then they each have three parent-child sessions. Then they would go right into mediation or some other negotiation to use these skills to settle their case. And for example, there's two programs got funding for this in Alberta, Canada. And what they found is after about three years, because they've been doing the programs now, uh, one, one city, Calgary, for three years, another little city called Medicine Hat, is starting their, about to start their fifth year. And they've got about 80% of their high conflict couples settling the case out of court without having to go to court after they do this process. So it's, it's at the beginning of the process. In, in most of those cases where they've been studied, it's been court ordered. So the judge orders both parents to get new ways for families skills and then to try to do mediation. And about 80% of those cases have been resolving out of court. So it helps if people have that preparation and then quickly go into mediation. I mean, those kinds of skills can fade, especially for high conflict people. Um, but it also helps if the mediator's been trained in some of these methods. That's why new ways for mediation is similar to new ways for families and it reinforces the parties practicing more skills at problem solving rather than the decision makers doing it for them and then having them go out and fight the decision anyway which is what <laughs> often happens with high conflict people in court cases yes that's right and certainly we talked about um, in between sessions um, and parties maybe you know the the left side of the brain going back up again uh, you've talked before about um, where um, parties might be able to, to reduce the level of conflict enough to get uh, uh, an understanding reached, but then later on they start reverting to type again because perhaps they've not had any help. Is, is, I take it these uh, programs that you've developed look into that in, in the more longer term. Yeah, well, what we've tried to do is give people skills not only to make the big decisions, but to implement their decisions. And so as issues come up, say three months from now, they go, oh, I need to make a proposal. So they make a proposal or there's a hostile email and rather than reacting to it is doing a BIF response. And this is a big difference from what often happens with family courts where a couple gets no training for skills, they come in, the judge makes a big decision, then they go out 
then they fight over the decision. One or both of them doesn't implement the decision. So there's no benefit. And that's why we've been able to convince some of the court systems to adopt new ways for families, because it gives parents skills that they can keep using. Um, so that's the ideal. I want to mention, though, that we have, uh, we have five models of new ways for families now. Mm -hmm. So what I described is the full uh, court-ordered counseling model with six individual sessions, three parent-child sessions. There's also an out-of-court collaborative divorce model for people that do a collaborative divorce team. And it's three coaching sessions and three parent-child sessions. Then we also have a class and we train instructors for the class, which is three classes. And they, those classes emphasize BIF responses, making proposals, and calming yourself with encouraging statements. Sure. And then we have a fourth model is we call pre-mediation coaching. And so people who are doing mediation might say, well, I'm not going to get a judge to order this, but I can tell them I want to meet with each of them once for an hour or 50 minutes and go and go over pre-mediation coaching with them. And we have a workbook and a manual to help with that. And it teaches people how to prepare for mediation so that in mediation, they're working hard at using their skills. Sure. And then the fifth model we have is actually an online model. Um, it's 12 sessions. It's online. Anybody in the world can take it. It's uh, 12 one-hour sessions for $139 uh, U.S. dollars. Sure. And all of these, there's explanations on our website, newwaysforfamilies.com. But we're finding a lot of good response, and parents like the skills, and they're settling more of their cases in mediation rather than court by learning these skills. So we're, we're happy to tell people about it. It's not very expensive. It's really the cost of the counselor, the coach, or the mediator to meet with them beforehand. Yeah. The materials are very inexpensive. And even that online course, anybody anywhere could do that. You could say, look, I think it would help both of you if you would take this course um, right before we start the mediation. Uh, and do you think that um, the, the, the lessons that you're teaching in these courses, do you think the earlier the better? That they're, what is better? Uh, do you think that uh, the earlier that people take these lessons? Absolutely. The earlier the better. With, with all types of non-adversarial dispute resolution. That's so, the earlier, the better. If they get coaching like this before mediation, they're going to do much better in mediation. If they get mediation before court, you're going to take out 80 or more percent of people that might have gone to court. So non-adversarial approaches first is really the way it should be. And uh, what about after mediation, where parties perhaps forget about the BIF response and that kind of idea? Would there be coaching available for that? Oh, sure. It's it's available at any time. We're just trying to get it in early. Sure, sure. Um, and, and it's interesting, high-conflict court cases uh, sometimes are so entrenched, it's too late if they've spent like a year or two in court. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it still could be ordered. And actually in San Diego, when we started with this method, uh, the judges weren't sure about, so they started with their worst cases that were <laughs> post-divorce, after the divorce, and kept coming back. Yep. And yep. one judge said she ordered six cases like that, and only one of them came back. So wow. she thought that was a success. Yeah. I, I was certainly interested because I saw that you do training for the judges as well, and uh, certainly uh, judges, um, I don't know what they're like in, in your neck of the woods, but a lot of them tend to think, well, I know how to resolve this and I'll make my decision. Um, I, I don't think any of this coaching nonsense is necessary. Uh, did you find that it was a struggle in persuading the judges to take this on? Well, it's, there's, a, there's a range of judges thinking in family law. And I would say that, that traditionally judges, 
just are, are very focused on making the decisions, and especially if they're used to making decisions in civil cases, criminal cases. It's like, you know, you each get a turn and I decide. Um, but people, judges who've been working with family law cases for a while, start realizing that, that there's a lot of unique problems here. And me just deciding doesn't necessarily solve them, especially the people that keep coming back. And so I think we're seeing judges open to, to parent education. And most court systems, at least in the United States now, require some amount of parent education. Maybe it's a four-hour class about divorce, but they want parents to get that. Sure. And those are good. They're just not geared, in my mind, to the kind of skills people need to make their decisions. And then um, in many ways, yeah, they're more left-brain oriented, kind of here's some information. And our approach is here's some relationship skills. And that's more right-brain kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. But yes, I think, I think judges are frustrated with family law. So some of them are open and some of them just can't wait to get out. <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly interesting because uh, that, I, I was speaking to Karen uh, Bono recently and she mentioned um, quite clearly that a lot of these family issues, and there are exceptions of course, but a lot of them, it's got nothing to do with the law. It's about family relationships. So why should oh, yes, you yes. be involved? Yeah. I would say that most of the issues in today's family court are not legal issues. They're, they're personality issues, um, family dynamics issues, but they're, and many of them are mental health issues. A lot of the people that use the family courts the most have one or two people with mental health issues, but they're not identified, so they're arguing about child support or they're arguing about holidays when in fact it's it's someone has a real problem yeah and maybe half the cases it's one person and half the cases it's both people and that's part of why just the judge making a decision often has very little impact on the family yeah um, so they've got to have some other work like coaching um uh, training to solve problems because these are people with fewer and fewer problem-solving skills. Yeah, and and you've obviously done a lot of research uh, in high conflict situations, um, thinking about those people um, who do take it to court. Do you tend to find that um, the high conflict people um, they're more likely to want a third party to make a decision, or less likely? Are, are more likely to what? I didn't understand. Uh, are they more likely for a, a, a third party, uh, to want a third party decision uh, maker to, to make the decision, in other words, a judge to make the decision, or would a high conflict individual prefer to make that decision themselves? You know, it's tough because the, the high conflict people think in terms of right and wrong, all or nothing. And so in their mind, they think they know what's right. And they'll say, this is what we have to do. This is what we should do. And a lot of high conflict people think everyone knows that this is the right way. So if we go to court, the judge will make the other person do what I see is the right way. So they come in with that. And then the judge doesn't see it their way. And they go, something's wrong here. The judge didn't understand. I'm going to have to go back to court again and again. And so it's, it's because they see the world in this all or nothing way that attracts them to court because court tends to be structured as, you know, you're guilty or you're not guilty. And family court isn't supposed to be like that. But Often it becomes like that, and the judge is deciding, well, this parent's been bad, and this parent's been good. And one thing I teach judges, I teach all professionals, is you have to have three theories when one person says the other person's acting badly. The first theory is they might be right. It might be true. Let's say this person does do domestic violence or child abuse or 
alienate the children or do things they shouldn't do. The second theory is this person actually is the problem and this person's innocent and this person is projecting and blaming and shouldn't be. And so this person has a problem. And the third is that they both may have a problem. And so judges often get attached to one of those three theories and go, oh, well, this is a domestic violence case. It's this guy is the problem. Or this is a false allegations case, and this guy is the problem. But it doesn't help to do that because some of the time they're going to be wrong, and some of the time it's both people, and they both need some change. They need some guidance. And that's why coaching before the big decisions is the best time uh, to do that. But lots of dilemmas, and I, I empathize with judges because they have very little background usually, and they're just trying to make a decision. But the, the really aware judges um, are looking at programs, looking at methods. They believe in mediation. They believe in counseling. And I've had judges say, you're much better off to do this out of court. You know, I really want you to give that a try. Sure, sure. Well, I wish that message spreads uh, far and wide and across to Scotland as, <laughs> as soon as possible. Uh, Bill, I, I wish we had more time here, um, uh, given how fascinating you've been, as always. But in the interest of being brief, informative, friendly and fun, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to thank you again for talking to me today. Thank you very much for the opportunity, and I want to wish all your viewers well. Thanks very much. And you've been watching and listening to Video Cam and Audio Cam for Cam Scotland.